Today, as I share my screen, we want to talk about a topic that's very dear to the hearts of Seventh-day Adventists, and that's the concept of the remnant. And uh, I titled this one, The Open Remnant, because of a couple surprises that uh, uh, we will come to before we are done. But uh, remnant is a concept that uh, Seventh-day Adventists have felt in a real sense identifies them within the scriptures. And uh, that's found in Revelation 12, verse 17. As you've seen from our earlier studies, this is a very central text in Adventist understanding. The dragon was angry with the woman and he went away to make war with the remnant of her seed. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So there you see that key word remnant. And as Adventists have understood that uh, this is identifying a movement at the end of time of people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And Adventists have understood the testimony of Jesus to be a reference to the spirit of prophecy uh, that we have had among us. So for, for Adventists, this has been a very central text identifying the movement, uh, and I would point out that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist pioneers in reading Revelation saw the idea of an end-time movement, saw the idea of, cer of certain package of ideas that God wanted to share with the world at the end of time, and said, why not us? Uh, in other words, uh, it is the book of Revelation that created the movement rather than people designing to do so. It was from their study of Revelation that the movement got its start. But the question is, you know, just reading the text, who are the remnant? And uh, is it the organized Seventh-day Adventist church or not? And that has become a somewhat of a controversial position because after all, it doesn't say remnant church. It simply says the remnant. A, a more open idea. So the question, you know, many people say, just like they don't see the word Sabbath in the book of Revelation, they don't see the word remnant church in the book of Revelation. They say, you know, identifying this with the Seventh-day Adventist institution would not be appropriate. Increasing numbers even of Seventh-day Adventists are challenged with the concept of the remnant. And it's become a barrier in the minds of seekers in the secular community. Uh, I'll tell you a little story that brought that to my attention some years ago. I was uh, working in the backyard uh, in uh, Michigan near Andrews University where I taught for many years. And there was a small fence uh, about one meter high uh, that separated my uh, backyard from the neighbor's backyard. And I had a garden near that fence and my neighbor was trimming a tree just not far away. So we were like, you know, five meters apart and uh, could see each other. And uh, we, were, we were doing our work and he came over to the fence and he said, you know, I want to share something with you. He says, uh, I'm thinking about becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. I says, oh, that's great. I said, what, what led you to that? And he shared you know, some of the background and some meetings that he had attended. And uh, then he said, but there's one problem. Don't you love it when people say that? But there's one problem. And I said, what's that? He said, the remnant. It sounds so arrogant. And that was the first time I had run into that concept. And, and uh, more and more, I've uh, been seeing that in various uh, places. I shared this uh, not so long ago uh, in an evangelism conference and was challenged by an evangelist from Mexico. And he said, no, he says, remnant's not a problem here. Uh, you know, you're, you're mistaken. After the meeting, about five of his younger colleagues from Mexico came up to me and said, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It is a big problem in Mexico. Be that as it may. Uh, for many, at least, uh, around the world. The concept of the remnant is a challenging concept because it suggests that there is one denomination, one organization that God favors above all others, 
that is superior in the minds of today's world. That's a challenging concept. And so because of that, the General Conference uh, introduced a study uh, in the Biblical Research Committee that I've been a member of for 20 years. And uh, the idea is let's restudy the remnant. Let's do a historical study. Let's do a biblical study and, and see whether we are on solid ground or not. And uh, so we began that study and I wanna share the results of that study with you and then offer some thoughts of my own at the end. So what is the identity of the remnant? When you go to the book of Revelation, there are a number of factors that are associated with the remnant. One of these is it comes at the end of earth's history. And of course, we believe that uh, Revelation 12, 17 reflects the very last period of earth's history. Uh, so that is where uh, we are today. Uh, remnant is also at the close of Daniel's time prophecies. You may remember when we studied Revelation 10 uh, back on Thursday, I believe it was, uh, we noticed how it identified that at the close of Daniel's time prophecies would be a final movement of proclaiming the gospel and the gospel in the context of Daniel and Revelation. It says the remnant would have a prophetic visionary gift. And that certainly uh, would apply to Seventh-day Adventist understanding. The remnant would be the object of worldwide attention. And it would be, have a message of worldwide significance. In other words, everybody would be talking about it. Now, if you're applying the remnant to the Seventh-day Adventist church, a number of these things fit, but object of worldwide attention, message of worldwide significance is not at this time uh, a, a reality, but it could be so in the future. So we don't disqualify on that basis, but just notice that the full understanding of remnant, the full significance of the remnant is something that uh, has not yet happened in history. So what is the message of the remnant? When you look at that end time movement in the book of Revelation, you notice a number of things. And I have texts next to each of them. Uh, so if you wanna jot those down quickly, uh, you can do so. So you have the gospel, uh, the end time message would include the gospel. It would be an emphasis on the books of Daniel and Revelation. So it would be a special gospel in the light of the end time. And then it would be a message about the heavenly sanctuary. And we saw that in Revelation 11 uh, on Thursday as well. It would be a movement that keeps all of God's commandments. There's no point in making the commandments a distinguishing mark unless there's something different about it. And what is different is that in today's world, the vast majority of Christians do not keep the Sabbath command, at least not in the way that Seventh-day Adventists do. So keeping all of the commandments seemed important to the Adventist pioneers, uh, that uh, if the commandments are being mentioned, then it must be that there are some who don't keep them all. And so Adventists see that as something uniquely end time significant. Revelation 13, we saw a warning of end time deception. And uh, also there in Revelation 14, you'll find relationship with Jesus, very central. The hour of God's judgment, proclaiming the hour of God's judgment and a message about the Sabbath. So these eight characteristics are all drawn uh, from a natural study of the text of the book of Revelation, the gospel, Daniel and Revelation, sanctuary, keeping all the commandments, warning of end time deception, uh, uh, promoting a relationship with Jesus, proclaiming the hour of God's judgment, and uh, a message about the Sabbath, which would of course help to clarify why the suggestion that they keep all of God's commandments, so those two go together. Now, here's what the, I would see in this. 
This is a package of ideas that you won't find anywhere in the world except in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's not an arrogant statement. It's simply an observation. Find me any place where this package of ideas is taught, and they might be the remnant. But barring that, the Seventh-day Adventist Church seems to be the one group that carries this package of ideas. And the book of Revelation tells us that this package of ideas is exactly what the world needs at the end of time. And the question then would be, how does this package of ideas matter? We will come to that. But first of all, I just want you to notice this package of ideas is central to the mission of the remnant. So let's go back to the Old Testament to understand a bit more about this remnant concept. And uh, with, with Abraham, God made a covenant with Abraham. It was a universal covenant. It was an everlasting covenant. And he said that the key to this covenant is you will become a blessing to all the nations. So God did not call Abraham for himself. God called Abraham for the world. All the nations of the world, all the Gentiles will be blessed through you. This promise is repeated in Exodus 19 to Israel and saying, you, Israel, will be a kingdom of priests. Well, what is a priest? A priest is someone who stands between uh, God and the people. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests standing between God and the nations of the world. Israel was not called for itself. Israel was called for the sake of the world. That was the mission of Israel. So the goal of that mission was to restore the Garden of Eden, to restore the universe to the condition it was in before sin. Therefore, Israel's call was a call for the nations. How did that go? Well, it clearly wasn't fulfilled yet in Joshua's day. They had a land, they had a place, but they were still not engaged with the entire world. And as we look through the Old Testament, we realize Israel failed to obtain the promise. Israel never was the blessing to the nations that God had called them to be. You think of the time of the judges with all the fighting and the confusion. You think of uh, the time of Solomon, and perhaps that's the high point of Israel's history. The Queen of Sheba story is when people are starting to come from the nations to Israel to find out about their God. It was beginning to happen. Israel was at its highest uh, level of power and prosperity. But then came Jeroboam and the split into two kingdoms. And then the wickedness of Ahab and the super wickedness of Manasseh. And then the captivity and then the occupation. So the history of the Old Testament is a history of failure and disgrace. So what is God going to do? God's response was the remnant concept. If Israel as a whole would not be the means by which God blesses the nations, he would reach out to a portion of Israel, that portion which was faithful to God, that portion which was willing uh, to work with God's plan. But here's the interesting piece that we discovered in that general conference committee. And uh, there's a book on the remnant uh, in the Bible that was published, uh, I think in 2009, uh, that shares the things that I'm sharing with you here. So this is not uh, something unique to me. And it's the idea that the remnant concept was a threefold concept. It had three different manifestations. One of these was past tense. At any point, in biblical history, you could look into the past and see a historical remnant. 
A historical remnant would be, for example, Noah from the flood. The very first mention of a remnant in the Bible is in the flood story. Noah was that remnant. And then you have Abraham from among the 70 nations. And you have Israel from Egyptian slavery. And you have Israel also coming back from the conquest by Assyria and by Babylon. So there was a historical remnant. As you can see, you can name the remnant. You can count it. You can tell its story. It's a visible entity. And uh, that visible entity, Israel, for example, is a historical remnant of what God did in the Exodus. So in the Exodus story, God did a mighty act here on this earth. And uh, so the nation of Israel was formed to celebrate that mighty act and to share it with the world. But here's the thing. When you look at these remnants, you discover they are a mixed bag. They are not necessarily faithful. Noah was the most faithful man of his time. And yet, it uh, turns out he had a problem with alcohol later on. Um, Abraham was certainly a man of faith. And yet, there were times when he struggled with his faith and when he, he tried to resolve God's problems with actions of his own that caused a lot of trouble. Israel, of course, was anything but a consistently faithful entity. So the problem with the historical remnant is it's a mixed bag of faithful, unfaithful people. Uh, take a look at 2 Chronicles 30, verse 6. It says, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may turn again to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. So here you have Israel, the historical remnant. Is it faithful? Look at the text. The answer is no. They are being called to return to the Lord. So a historical remnant isn't necessarily faithful, but by its existence, it does bear witness to the reality of what God had done through Israel in the past and the Exodus on. So historical remnants may not be truly faithful to God, yet they can still serve a purpose in bearing witness to what God did at some time in the past. A second type of remnant is the faithful remnant, and this is present tense. So in the present tense, you look at that historical remnant, and there's a portion of that remnant usually that is faithful to the original mission, faithful to the original message. And that faithful remnant uh, is uh, what the term designates uh, in uh, specific uh, instances. Out of the visible remnant, there are some who are faithful. And so we see as an example, 1 Kings chapter 19, a, an excellent example of the faithful remnant. Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. That word left here is one of the Hebrew words for remnant. In other words, Elijah looked at the historical remnant, Israel, and said, really, this is a mess. In fact, I'm the only one left, the only faithful one that's still left. So for Elijah, the faithful remnant was very, very small. But notice what God replies to him. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So what does God say? Elijah, you're not alone. There are 6,999 other people in Israel that are faithful to me, that are faithful to the mission, faithful to the message that I have outlined for Israel. So this tells us 
that out of the visible remnant, there would be a faithful remnant, but this is an invisible remnant. The faithful remnant are not visible in human terms. You can't name them. You can't count them. We're having a camp meeting together here with I don't know how many people gathered together right now. I don't know who among us is faithful and who is not, and neither do you. The faithful remnant are those that God knows to be faithful. They are those that God can use to bless the world. So the faithful remnant is a present tense concept. Out of the historical remnant, there are some that God knows are faithful to him. A third type of remnant is the eschatological remnant. This is future tense. So you see, at any point in history, you could be looking in the past at historical remnants. You could be seeing faithful remnants in the present out of those historical remnants, and you could look to the future and see an eschatological remnant. Isaiah 66 is an example. I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations. Uh, that's a translational concept, as I mentioned uh, earlier today, that uh, the uh, uh, the Bible we have in the English or in the Afrikaans, uh, these are translations of the original, and uh, you don't always need to use the same word to express something, but this is the remnant. I will send the remnant to the nations. That would be, I assume, the faithful remnant would be the ones that God can use. I will send my remnant to the nations. The nations, what nations? that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. So who are these nations? These are the enemy nations. These are the outsiders. These are people who don't know God. And look what it says. They shall declare my glory among those nations, and they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord. So you see, in the future, Isaiah sees uh, a remnant going out into the nations and finding a remnant in those nations and bringing them home, so to speak, to Israel, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. This is a surprise to Isaiah. Isaiah thought that Israel was it. And then God reveals to him in vision that there are believers or potential believers throughout the nations and as the faithful ones of Israel go out, as they become priests to the nations, those faithful ones will be found and they will be brought back. So you find here that this eschatological remnant is bigger than Israel. In fact, it's a surprising remnant. It is, uh, in a sense, unpredictable just what that remnant will be like in the future. One more text. Amazing text. In fact, I'm not sure I ever heard uh, people generally preaching on this text because most preachers don't know exactly what to do with it. But in the context of remnant, this passage makes sense. In that day, and that's a Hebrew way of talking about the future, usually the far future. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. Now, here's an amazing thing. The Egyptians and the Assyrians were the superpowers of Isaiah's world, and they hated each other. The idea that they would worship together was almost unthinkable. And yet that's what Isaiah sees God promise. And then verse 24, in that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. Did you see what just happened there? Do you remember that Abraham was promised to be a, to be a blessing to the nations? Egypt and Assyria is now included in the promise to Abraham. They too will be missionaries to the world. This is amazing. And in verse 25, the Lord Almighty will bless them saying, 
Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. The language of God's people is now applied to Egypt and Assyria as well. So let's summarize what Isaiah has learned. Isaiah has a historical remnant, and that would be the Israel of the Exodus. That's the Israel that Isaiah was speaking to, uh, made up of two nations now, Judah and Israel. So there's a historical remnant that still recalls the Exodus. But then there was the faithful remnant in Isaiah's day, and that was the faithful who would one day be in Babylon and then return from Babylon. So there would be a faithful remnant, even in the midst of all of Israel's troubles. But eschatological remnant would be much bigger. At the return from exile is the initial uh, reference of that. But ultimately, the New Testament tells us Isaiah's remnant is the church. And that was much bigger much more international, unpredictable. If we could raise Isaiah from the dead right now and bring him into this Zoom conference and say, Isaiah, good to have you here. I said, did you know, Isaiah, that there's 2 billion people all around the world reading your book and, and, and following uh, its teachings and celebrating the Exodus? What would Isaiah say? He would probably be stunned. I didn't see that coming. For all the glory of my vision would seem almost impossible. I never would have dreamed of that. So the eschatological remnant is a surprise. It's bigger and more international than even the prophet expected. When you come to the New Testament, you have a similar threefold concept in Paul. And Paul says uh, in Romans 11, some very interesting things. He says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Uh, people have sometimes wondered, has God rejected the Jews? Paul's answer is no. He says, and the proof of that is that many Jews like me are following Jesus. So being a Jew is not to live under God's rejection. In fact, a Judaism remains as a witness to the Exodus. It remains as a witness to the Sabbath. More people know about the Sabbath because of uh, the Jews than because of Seventh-day Adventists. So a historical remnant, Isaiah's historical remnant, uh, we would say for Paul, with the Judaism of his day, the Israel of the Old Testament. God has not rejected them. And then he quotes from 1 Kings, and, and what the text we've already read. And then verse 5, he says, So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. So Paul has a clear concept that God has a historical remnant, Israel, the Jewish people. God also has a faithful remnant, those Jews following Jesus. But as you go through Romans 11, he casts a vision of the future, a vision in which that remnant would be expanded to include all the Gentiles and all of Israel as well. The eschatological remnant would be much bigger. So let's summarize Paul's remnant. His historical remnant is Old Testament Israel, the Israel of the Exodus. His faithful remnant, present tense, would be the followers of Jesus in his day. You see how these three remnants are present, past, and future at any point in history. The eschatological remnant is the end time church. And if you were to resurrect Paul to be part of this Zoom meeting, we tell him, Paul, there are two billion people in the world that read your letters and that follow Jesus. What would Paul say? I didn't see that coming. That's more amazing than anything I would have expected. So then we get to Revelation, the remnant in Revelation. 
uh, mentioned in Revelation 12, 17. And that remnant is bigger, more international, and unpredictable, just like we have seen. Notice Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So this is a vision of an eschatological remnant. That is an amazing vision in the book of Revelation. So how do Seventh-day Adventists fit in to all of this? What do we do today? Where are the three remnants today? The historical remnant, I believe, is historic Adventism. I don't think it's arrogant to say that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the historical remnant of Revelation. It's not arrogant to say that because remnants are not inherently faithful. Remnants are, historical remnants are a mixed bag. A mixed bag of faithful people and unfaithful people. But Seventh-day Adventists are a living witness as a denomination to a mighty act of God back uh, in the 19th century. A mighty act of God that brought to our attention what God is doing in the heavenly sanctuary and his mission and message for the world today. So historic Adventism, the Adventist church is a historical remnant today. It is the only body on this earth that carries within it those eight uh, message package that we talked about early, earlier. So the Adventist church is the only entity in this world that could be the historical remnant. So do not be ashamed to be a Seventh-day Adventist. At the same time, do not see it as a position of pride because simply being a historical remnant is nothing to boast about. It is a tool in God's hands. It is not uh, so much an honored place. So who are the faithful remnant? They would be those Seventh-day Adventists who bear the original mission and identity. And some people say, well, can't Lutherans be the remnant? And I would say, in their own way, yes. The Lutheran church is a living witness to what God did back in the Reformation day. Simply by existing as a denomination, faithful or not, it is a witness to God, just as Judaism is a historical witness of the Exodus. The Roman Catholic Church can be a historical witness to what God did uh, in Jesus Christ and back in the first century. So the existence of a religious body doesn't prove that they are faithful or unfaithful. Uh, that we would determine from other reasons. But they can still, as an entity, bear witness. But the remnant of revelation cannot be applied to churches that don't have that package of message that the remnant is to have. And what is the eschatological remnant of revelation? It's still ahead. All that we know is that it'll be bigger, more international, unpredictable. So the remnant today, there's more than one remnant in scripture and history. This is summing up what we learned in the General Conference Committee. There's more than one remnant in scripture and history. There's no guarantee for historical remnants. Just because you are a Seventh-day Adventist and a member of the church does not guarantee your place in heaven, does not guarantee that you are on God's side today. Historical remnants are a mixed bag. What counts is faithfulness to the message and the mission. And there's one more thing we've learned here. There's something way bigger coming. Would you like me to speculate with you just a little bit how that may happen? What is that way bigger thing? What is that eschatological remnant? How big, how surprising will it be? If you'll walk with me, I'll take you on a short journey through the history of Christianity. And one of the amazing things I find in today's world is the history of Christianity that you find in the book, Great Controversy. 
is no longer controversial. The kind of history that Ellen White put together that Adventists have been teaching for years is now commonly taught among the great historians of the world. And I'm going to share with you three historians uh, that I know personally and that are considered the best in their field. Uh, the first is James Dunn. He's a historian of first century Christianity. And uh, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, I believe he's a British evangelical. Uh, but he wrote this book, The Partings of the Ways, between Christianity and Judaism and their significance for the character of Christianity. You see, Dunn identifies within that first century the seeds of Christianity's decline as an entity. Christianity as a remnant had a powerful beginning, but it very quickly began to decline. And Dunn identifies that decline as a result of the breakup with Judaism. You see, Christianity emerged from Judaism. They worshiped the same God. They read the same scripture, what we call the Old Testament. They worshiped in the same temple in Jerusalem. They were one people. That's how Christianity began. But then, in the first century already, began a parting of the ways, a pulling apart. And the decisive period was from about 70 to 135. Jesus died around 30, 31. And the decisive period when Christianity and Judaism began to divide was in 70 to 135. And as Dunn portrays it, the parting of the ways was almost like a bargain at the table. Imagine Jews and Christians sitting down at a table and saying, okay, if we're going to split apart, who gets to keep what? And the Jews would look at the Christians and say, you know, we love the Messiah. But every time we talk about the Messiah, people think we're talking about Jesus, and we can't have that, so you keep the Messiah. And the Christians said to the Jews, we love the Sabbath, but every time we worship on Sabbath, people think we're Jews, and we can't have that, so you keep the Sabbath. And the Jews said to the Christians, we love the eschatology of the scriptures, the end time picture but every time we get excited about that end time picture, the Romans come and slap us upside the head. Now you keep the eschatology. And the, the Christians said to the Jews, you know, we love the Old Testament and it's the foundation of our New Testament. But, you know, every time we talk about the Old Testament, people think we're Jews and we can't have that. So you keep the Old Testament. You see, here's the thing that Dunn pointed out. When religions break apart, they both lose something. They lose something of what made them unique originally. And Christians and Jews in the split both gave up quite a bit. That story continues through the early centuries. And there's another book called Lost Christianities, The Battles for Scripture and the Faiths We Never Knew by Bart Ehrman. Ehrman is not a Seventh-day Adventist either. In fact, he doesn't claim to be a Christian. He claims to be an agnostic, but like Dunn, he is one of the world's leading scholars on early Christianity, the first centuries of Christianity, someone that I have uh, met personally. And I think generally is considered the expert on this picture. And he tells us that there were five or six versions of early Christianity. In other words, the New Testament uh, did not sprout a single line, but there were a number of versions of early Christianity. Only one of these became orthodox in the sense of Christianity as we know it today. Western Christianity was uh, resulted from one of these five or six versions of early Christianity. A different one was accepted by Jesus' family. But here's the interesting thing. Jesus' own family, you know, his nephews and cousins and so on, and all the way down from there, Jesus didn't have children. His family was not Orthodox. Their Christianity was not like ours 
generally today. Each of these five or six versions of early Christianity could find support in the New Testament. So the New Testament was broadly based, and Ehrman points out the New Testament had a broad picture of what it meant to be a Christian. But then along came a fellow named Constantine. And Constantine wanted to unite the empire. And he saw Christianity as the best way to do that. If everyone become Christians, uh, they could be united by their religion. And so Constantine and, and the emperors after him worked to eliminate opposition to the standard Orthodox Christianity that was accepted in the empire. Jewish Christianity was one of these that did not survive. Jewish Christianity was accepted by Jesus' family. It kept the Sabbath. It emphasized obedience. It emphasized the importance of the Old Testament for Christian faith. And Ehrman, though he does not claim to be a Christian, laments this. He says Christianity lost many great ideas in the orthodoxation of Constantine. It sounds like great controversy, doesn't it? In fact, uh, Ehrman's uh, graduate assistant at the time he wrote this book was a Seventh-day Adventist, a friend of mine uh, who's a teacher at Walla Walla University today. And I asked him, how much influence did you have on this book? And he said, none at all. He says, I wasn't involved in helping him with that book. He had other assistants as well. So this is not a Seventh-day Adventist speaking to the kind of history that Great Controversy tells us. So it's an amazing story. Christianity is not what it was. And this has become recognized by historians. And there are consequences to these losses, according to Ehrman. One of these is the parting of the ways with Judaism, which in many ways has weakened Christianity and Judaism. It has resulted in narrow and selective readings of the New Testament because other readings of the New Testament were identified with rivals. These were discarded. And you select those texts that support what you believe. And so the understanding of the New Testament is narrow and not broad. This general ignorance of the Old Testament among Christians in general. And Ehrman himself laments these things. Says Christianity isn't what it was and could gain a lot by restoring what it has lost. And another of the things that resulted was Islam, the precipitation of Islam. Because Judaism and Christianity were fighting in Arabia and because they had lost so much, there was a need for a revival that would change some things. And I wanna share with you a little bit from the Quran, which you may not be familiar with, but you will be amazed, I think, at what we're about to read. One of the messages in the Quran, in other words, Muhammad did not come to start a new religion. Just as Jesus did not come to start a new religion, he came to reform Judaism, and when that failed, uh, a new religion developed. Muhammad didn't come to start a new religion. He came to reform the Judaism and the Christianity that he experienced in Arabia. Notice this text, say ye, we believe in Allah and the revelation given to us and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants of Jacob, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them, and we bow to Allah. So he is saying here that the prophets of Judaism and Christianity are to be respected as equals. This is not the language of somebody who's discarding what came before to start something new. It was a reform movement in the beginning. The prophets of Judaism and Christianity are to be respected as equals. Notice what it says in blue, to those who believe in Allah and his messengers, plural. 
and make no distinction between any of them, we shall soon give their due rewards. Notice the first part of this, very strong language. Those who deny Allah and his messengers, plural. Those who wish to separate Allah from his messengers, plural, saying we believe in some but reject others, they are in truth unbelievers. In other words, if you pick one or another of these prophets to follow, you are not a true Muslim. You are to respect all of them equally. Another message in the Quran is that the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity are normative for the Muslim. This may be a surprise to you, uh, but it is there in the text. It is Allah who sent down to thee step by step in truth, the book. What is the book? That would be the Quran. That would be the, the oral messages uh, that he understood were coming from God. And what was the purpose of the Quran? Confirming what went before it. What went before it? And he sent down the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus before this as a guide to mankind. So, the purpose of the Quran was not to contradict, but to confirm what the Old and New Testaments were teaching. Those scriptures were scriptures also for the Muslim. In another text, it says, if thou wert in doubt as to what we have revealed unto thee, this is God speaking to Muhammad. If you're in doubt as to whether this is really from me, Ask those who have been reading the book from before thee. In other words, what's in the Quran was already there in the Bible. Ask those who have been reading the book from before thee. The truth hath indeed come to thee from thy Lord. So be in no wise of those in doubt. So the message here is that the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity, Old and New Testaments, are normative for the Muslim. And finally, it says Judaism and Christianity are valid expressions of Islam. In other words, there's no reason for conversion. Say to the people of the book and to those who are unlearned, do you not also submit yourselves? If they do, they're in right guidance. But if they turn back, thy duty is to convey the message and in Allah's sight are all his servants. So even those who refuse, are considered servants of Allah. And this is clarified even further here. Had not Allah checked one set of people by means of another, there'd have been pulled down monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of Allah is commemorated in abundant measure. In other words, the true faith of God is not simply in mosques, but it's in monasteries, churches, and synagogues as well. You see, Muhammad's vision was not to start a new religion, but to reform the religion that had gone before, to bring Judaism and Christianity back to the original faith that they had discarded. And so, the, one of the consequences of the parting of the ways is Islam, an attempt to restore what had been lost. Did it succeed? No. Even within the lifetime of Muhammad, wars began in which Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in Arabia parted ways. And when religions break apart, what do we know? They all lose something. And so what you had after this division among the monotheistic religions of the world into three parts, what you have is three religions, all worshiping one God. All, they believe, worshiping the same God. You may hear different things among some Seventh-day Adventists, but if you ask a Muslim, what is the God that they worship? It's the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, and the God of Jesus. That's the God that I worship. So Christianity, Judaism, and Islam were monotheistic religions. But they broke apart and they ended up hostile to one another. And uh, 
Often when we look at other religions, we ask the question, what's wrong with them? And one day I thought, let me ask the question, what's right with them? If there was this common heritage, is there something in each of these that is right, that still reflects God's original mission? And with Christianity, the core values of Christianity that are rejected by the other two are gospel, grace, and Jesus, uh, at least Jesus in his full divinity. Islam does accept him as a great prophet. Judaism, law, obedience, and Sabbath. These are core values of Judaism generally rejected by the other two. What are the core values of, values of Islam? Submission, judgment, eschatology. These are core values generally rejected by Christianity and Judaism. And I'm not making this up. I have shared this at a conference in which Christians, Jews, and Muslims were all gathered together uh, to share uh, what uh, they had in common and what they had distinct. And uh, this was recognized as a good summary of the core values of these faiths. What you may not know about Islam is that the central question of Islam is what is it that truly matters at the end of life? When you come to the end of your life, what is it that will really matter? Will you wish you had played more computer games or watched more TV? Or would you wish you had spent more time with God and spent more time uh, in doing good deeds for others? That's the core question of Islam. And the answer is God and good works are the things that really matter. When you come to the end of your life, that's what will matter. When you come to the end of the world and you look back, what really matters is God and good works. And it's interesting that Adventism asks the same question. What is the one thing that we take with us into eternity? What's the answer? Our character, the things that we have done, who we have become on this earth. So there's a very interesting, both Adventism and Islam are eschatological religions. They both live in the light of the judgment. That was a discovery for me uh, after September, the original September 11, uh, which by the way, we are acknowledging today, the 20th anniversary. So reviewing this, I think is very good at this time. So we have three monotheistic religions and uh, they've all split apart. They're hostile to each other, but they each carry some important elements uh, that go back to the beginning. And then there's a third historian, Philip Jenkins, who wrote a book called The Next Christendom, The Coming of Global Christianity. You're gonna like this a whole lot because Jenkins describes the history of Christianity as a geographical movement. Christianity began as an Eastern religion in the Middle East. And then it gravitated to Europe, first Rome and then Germany and England. And now the center of gravity of Christianity is in North America. But Jenkins says that is changing. The center of gravity of worldwide Christianity is moving South and East to the developing world. You are at the heart of growing Christianity today. And Jenkins said with amazement, he says, by the year 2050, the majority of Anglicans in the world will be in the South and in the East. And I was at the same conference, we were both speakers at, a, at the same conference, and I raised my hand and I said, you know, you, you're an Anglican, uh, but if you had written your book about Seventh-day Adventists, you could have written it 25 years sooner because we are already, the vast majority of Seventh-day Adventists are south of the equator and uh, east of Europe. And he laughed and smiled. He says, I know. <laughs> he says, I know. But then he said something really, really amazing. He said, as I asked myself, what book of the Bible would be the best for unifying this new worldwide Christianity, this 
uh, Christianity of the South and the East. He says, Christianity is returning to its roots as an Eastern religion. He says, what is the book that could best bind us together? And his answer was, focus on the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the place that can draw everyone together. And once again, I was amazed because that's my conviction too. You see, the book of Revelation has a message, a unique message that is designed for the end time situation, the situation we find ourselves in now. And you have these eight qualities, these eight messages. We've seen them before. We've looked at them in detail. Gospel, Daniel and Revelation, sanctuary, the commandments of God. End time deception, relationship with Jesus, hour of judgment, Sabbath, right? But as you look at the message of the remnant, are you seeing what I am seeing? Take a good look at that message. And then take a look at this. The remnant of revelation contains all the core elements of the three monotheistic religions. The gospel, grace, Jesus, law, obedience, Sabbath, submission, judgment, eschatology. And suddenly it dawned on me, God knows what he is doing. 2,000 years ago, he foresaw the situation of the world as we have it today. He would see that the world needs healing. It needs healing among the religions. These divisions have produced way too much violence, way too much killing from the Crusades all the way uh, to Afghanistan. The history of religion is a bloody and miserable history. And God has placed a message in the book of Revelation that can attract people from every imaginable background. In other words, Adventism in embracing that message of revelation has the potential to reach Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, like no other Christian body. Let me share that with you uh, from my own experience. In the Middle East, Everybody knows who a Christian is and who a Muslim is. It's very easy to see. And I had a chance to live uh, in the Middle East for several months and have visited many times since. And one thing I noticed very early is that there are distinctions between Christianity and Islam that are plain. If you go into a grocery store in the Middle East, and it's selling alcohol, what do you know? It's a Christian store. If there's no alcohol on offer, it's a Muslim store. But where do Adventists fit here? Take pork. If a Muslim decides to convert to Christianity, he will sit down in front of his family, drink alcohol, and eat a piece of pork, and everyone will know that he's gone over to the dark side. You see, I was wondering about this, because I remember the very first trip we took in Israel, the driver was a Palestinian Muslim, and we were interacting all day, and toward the end of the day, I was sitting in the jump seat right at the front next to the driver, and he turned and gave me a strange look. He says, you're an American, aren't you? I said, yes. Then how come you're not a Christian? And I was offended. I was really offended. Man, I'm a Christian. I'm definitely a Christian. He says, no, he says, he says, I know plenty of Christians. You're no Christian. I thought it was an insult, but it was not. He was saying, you're on our side. You're different from the other Christians. Take it a step further. If you go into a travel agency in Israel and the women are dressed modestly, 
It's a Muslim travel agency. If they're dressed like Vogue magazine or, or uh, Hollywood fashions, it's a Jewish or a Christian uh, travel agency. If you ask somebody in the Middle East what they think of the papacy, Muslims will give you a negative response. Christians will usually give a positive response. If you ask the view of America, Muslims will usually give a negative response and Christians a positive response. If you talk about how serious you are about the faith, most Muslims I met in the Middle East were very serious about their faith, serious about their obedience. Most Christians were not. So if you're in the Middle East and you're a Seventh-day Adventist, where do you fit? You're much closer to Islam than you are to Christianity. I've understood from missionaries to India that the same is true there, that Adventists tend to be closer to the native religions in many ways than they are to other Christians. In other words, God has designed an end time movement that doesn't have the barriers to interacting with Muslims that Christians have. Adventism doesn't have the barriers for working with Jews that Christians have. It doesn't have the barriers with Hindus. And that's the amazing thing at Loma Linda University. We have all the faiths in the world working together on a common mission to continue the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus. We have Muslims, we have Hindus, we have Jews. And they are all committed to that same mission. It's a stunning thing that I've not really seen in most other places. But that's because God has called a people who don't have the barriers to interacting with other faiths that most Christians do. Do you see that God knows what he is doing? He truly does. And if I have a fear at this point, it's because at the very time God is waking Adventists up to the possibilities that are there in the unique version of Christianity that we have embraced. Just at the time when our opportunities are growing, many Adventists are embracing uh, perspectives that bring a great deal of hostility toward Muslims and toward people of other faiths. But God himself says that the remnant of revelation is the way back from hostility. It is his mission to this generation. So the remnant is an open one, not historically, it's a Seventh-day Adventist remnant, not presently in the sense that it is among Seventh-day Adventists that you'll find the faithful remnant, but it's in the eschatological remnant, the future remnant, the amazing future that God has in mind that it will open us to people we would not have imagined. To be an Adventist is both the bearer of a vital and unique message and a divine calling in history. It's a wonderful thing. It's not arrogant because being a historical remnant is no guarantee. But it is an honor to be the bearer of such a great message. No reason for boasting or arrogance. And the exciting thing is something big is coming. Don't you want to be part of that? Let's pray. Lord, I know that this has probably been a startling message for many. But I'm grateful to you that you have placed in the book of Revelation the seeds of a remnant revolution that could transform the world. I pray that you would be with us as a people, particularly those attending this meeting. May we catch fire with a vision for the future. May we see the Muslim or the Jew or the Hindu walking down the street, not as an enemy, but rather as a soul for whom Christ died, as someone to whom we could reach out in friendship and find that we have more in common than we ever dreamed. You have called us as you called Israel to be a kingdom of priests to the world. And I pray that you would inspire us to embrace that mission as never before. 
But we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.